Thank you so much, Jeremy. And thank you, everybody. It's so exciting to be here today. I am here to tell you that nature is the best drug ever invented. I know this sounds wild, but please indulge me for just a few minutes. Using your imagination, I'd like you to join me. Let's time travel to Rio de Janeiro. It's February 1983, and Rio, in fact, all of Brazil, is experiencing a week-long extravaganza of music, dance, outrageous costumes, and parades. We call it Carnaval. Let's go farther, about four hours away from Rio. We arrive at this beautiful location called Mauá. It's tucked deep into the heart of the Atlantic forest. The sounds of drums and whistles fade into a symphony of birds, frogs, and waterfalls. Up on the hill, you see this young woman sitting there, gazing at the slush valley below. She's frowning. That young woman is me, the 19-year-old me. I was going through a really rough time. For one thing, I hated school with a passion. See, I've always been an artist, lover of music, photography, and movies. Why did I choose to pursue a degree in economics? Kids, go figure. So as I was sitting there, I was realizing all of Brazil, in this day in February, while they were drowning their sorrows in music and mind-bending caipirinhas, the most potent and famous Brazilian drink, I was drowning mine in my favorite place, Mawa's forest. The wet earth just filled the air with this wonderful fragrance, an explosion of patterns and textures and colors were just filling my view. I know just standing there, it was pure bliss. Orange blossoms and green canopies and white clouds over a deep blue sky. My worries melted away, my senses came alive. And the sense of awe and wonder led me to something incredible. I was 100% present in that moment. And because of it, I had two strong realizations. One of them is nature is medicine. And the second one was, I didn't know how or when but someday, some way, I was going to share this first realization with as many people as I could. So, with the help of people from all over the world, eventually, I ended up being able to write, shoot, and direct Love Thy Nature. And this is how my story connects with yours and the rest of the human race. You and I are living in extraordinary times. As a species, in our 200,000 year journey on this planet, this is the first time we have become an urban species. The norm now is to live in urban areas. More than half of the population in the world is now living in cities. We're typically surrounded by grayness, loud noises, and bad air. And when you zoom the camera back, you realize not only are we really devoid of nature for the most part, but also we're massively immersed in digital technology. Just in the US, the average person spends more than half their waking hours in screens, staring at screens, and usually more than one. You know who you are. <laughs> Usually, it's like keeping an eye on the phone over here and keeping an eye on the laptop and maybe the smartwatch, a little television in the background. I happen to have four eyes, but 
Not everybody is that lucky. In terms of our technology, when you think of it, it's like our brain cannot handle this level of multitasking. The whole idea of like opening 12 tabs on your browser and then all of a sudden doing some texting and maybe checking the feed, all of that is just too much information for our brain to be able to handle. It wasn't designed for that. This is what our brain was designed for, really. Oh my God, cheetah, run! Now the equation, oh my God, cheetah, run, plus carnations multiplied by check my feed equals poor outcome. You're going to get eaten. <laughs> now, at Stanford, Clifford Mass and his team of researchers decided to investigate the brains of people who are high multitaskers. So they were convinced, each of them was convinced, that somehow, some way, they were a star at something brain-related. They would excel at something, whether it's memory, attention, or cognition. So on PBS, Ness said, each one of them was completely shocked with the results. Because it turned out, heavy multitaskers are terrible at being able to ignore irrelevant information. They're terrible at being able to multitask, meaning doing several tasks efficiently. And it turns out they're terrible at being able to retain information. So in other words, compared to other people, heavy multitaskers perform poorly in the areas of cognition, attention, and memory, the three areas they were looking for. So you might ask, what is the antidote to that? Don't worry, I'm not gonna tell you to ditch your phone, but I will tell you though, it doesn't need to hijack your brain. It's like we can master technology without being a slave. You might ask, but how? In order to have an antidote for our urban digital hypercomplexity disorder, it's all about having a dose of nature, two times a day or as needed. See, as a species, more than 99% of our time on Earth has been spent in natural environments. When you think of it, Harvard scientist E.O. Wilson came up with a theory of biophilia, and he basically said, we have an innate tendency to want to affiliate with nature. Evolution has wired us to be connected with nature in two ways, really. There's the fear of nature, chia, and there's a love of nature, kittens. So when you think of biophilia, biophilia meaning the love of life, is that we really yearn for that connection. And this isn't far-fetched. I mean, if you were given the option to choose between a condo with a beautiful view to the ocean and a condo with a beautiful view to a parking lot, you would choose the beautiful view to the ocean. I mean, that's biophilia at work. And also, there's a reason why oceanfront condos get the big bucks. Corporations know all about biophilia. So, one afternoon, I ended up spending time, hours, just dissecting ads on television. It turns out that about half of them have nature to seduce us. Some of the ads do it in a way that's really obvious, like escape to the Bahamas, or a cute little cartoon gecko for auto insurance. <laughs> Other ads do it in a more subtle way. They actually cast nature on a supporting role. You can think of sand fascinating Johnny Depp on a fragrance commercial. Or that gorgeous mountainous road with a beautiful view to the ocean, 
laying bare for the ultimate driving machine. So corporations need us to think their products are absolutely amazing. So the trick is to wrap them around beautiful nature. The interesting thing is that they don't want you to know that the real object of your consumer lust is nature and not auto insurance. Why? Because if you end up spending time surfing the ocean, you're not going to be spending time surfing web ads. And if you end up going and hanging out with redwood trees, you're not going to be going to the shopping mall. There ain't credit card slots on tree trunks, not yet. And if most people, or all people, were to spend maybe just 20 minutes a day in nature, whether it's exercising or meditating, playing with kids, pharmaceutical companies would see their profits for anti-anxiety medications and antidepressants drop. I could just hear some of you thinking, oh, wait a minute, Sylvie, are you saying that nature is an antidepressant? Are you going insane? Right here at Stanford, Gregory Bretman did a study with his partners and colleagues. They sent two groups of people on 90-minute walks. One group went to the city, Palo Alto, to walk on streets, and the other group went to a park with oak trees and shrubs. They were interested in analyzing a part of the brain that's called the subjunior prefrontal cortex. It's the part of the brain that gets activated when we are in a state of illumination. That state of having repetitive negative thoughts and repetitive negative emotions that eventually lead to depression. So the result of this study is the group that went walking in the city had the rumination part of their brain pretty activated. The group that went out to nature had it quite dormant, totally reduced. The study conclusion was, if you spend time in nature, it reduces your negative thinking, it reduces the negative emotions, and eventually it prevents depression. And what the researchers were really trying to prove, right, is that urban developers and policymakers should know that those of us who live in cities, we should not be deprived of nature because that has a direct negative impact on our mental health. We need more nature in our cities, we need more nature in our businesses, in our schools, hospitals, and even homes. And needless to say, if we are to restore our ecosystems, that's absolutely critical for the health of our entire civilization. Now, wisdom traditions for millennia and artists and storytellers have been telling us, and they have been expressing in a number of different ways, the magnificence of nature. The exciting thing about our times is that finally, Western science has caught up. It's like just in the last couple of decades, we have had like a flood of studies that actually show that nature makes us happier, healthier, more creative, kinder and smarter human beings. And it's not just about healing the brain. Nature moves our hearts. There's something absolutely wondrous about spending time in the forest with its wildlife. There's something wondrous about snorkeling around corals with its carnival of sea life. And there's something wondrous about reaching the top of a mountain and just standing there, 100% present, to realize that we belong to something so much bigger than ourselves. And in that peace, in that contemplation, 
we are free to ponder. Why are we here? What is the meaning of life? What is our purpose in this oh so very short lifetime that goes by like a flash at a moment in time and in the vastness of the universe? Drink deeply the elixir nature. It's free, it's delicious, and it's everywhere. If you can just tap pause on the digital for a moment, come on in. The analog is amazing. I wish you nature. Thank you very much.